Today, we'll be asking the question, what if Julius Caesar was not assassinated? A quick thanks to The Great Courses Plus for sponsoring this video. There are nearly endless ways to explore the ripple effects of this alternate historical path, and so, in this mini-series, we'll be following a story arc based around Caesar's planned invasions of Dacia and Parthia, attested to by historical records. Our first part in the series will cover the following sections. The setup brings us all up to speed on the events of the day. The invasion plan covers what we know about the invasion strategy from historical records. The board pieces lays out the key players on the Ides of March, and the Dacian campaign walks through a plausible unfolding of events based on relevant historical parallels. Let's start from the beginning by getting the lay of the land. It's the first century BC and the Roman Republic has been succumbing to the rot of oligarchic misrule and militarized strongman politics. Most recently, in the 40s BC, it has been dragged through five years of brutal civil war fought between Julius Caesar and his opponents across virtually all corners of the realm. For more coverage of this conflict, I highly recommend you check out our video on the nine lives of Julius Caesar. In any case, by 45 BC, Julius Caesar had finally defeated the last of his opponents in Spain and returned to Rome as its undisputed master, where he was declared dictator for life. The state of the Republic at the time was one of exhaustion from decades of destruction wrought by corruption and civil war. Thus, Caesar both found a need and the popular support to set about establishing a new status quo. To put things briefly, he suppressed the powers of the traditional patrician elites and promoted the interests of the plebeians. Some example policies included land redistribution, Keynesian-style building projects, and citizenship enfranchisement. But while Caesar did manage to make some major changes, he was increasingly frustrated by opposing political forces in Rome which sought to overturn his progress and undermine his rule. This endless, ignoble back-alley politicking in Rome would have been a huge weight around the neck of a man like Julius Caesar, who was addicted to chasing ever greater glories through combat on the battlefield. His boundless energy could not be bottled up, and it's likely for this reason that he would have sought some escape hatch from the current situation. Thus in 45 BC, we see Julius Caesar begin to plan for new military actions. The primary target? Parthia. But why specifically Parthia? Well, if we go by the ancient historian Dio, the Roman public still clamored for vengeance after the humiliation of Crassus' defeat at Cari almost a decade ago, which resulted in the loss of the vaunted legionary eagles. By taking up this cause, Caesar would therefore have been able to build himself up as the ultimate champion of Rome who would bring down righteous justice against a yet unbested foe. This certainly would have added to the general's reputation and definitely would have fed into Caesar's compulsion to endlessly increase his dignitas. But there was also a slightly more practical motivation here as well. If Caesar was to rule a new Rome, he had to ensure its stability. This meant suppressing both internal and external threats. Parthia met both of these criteria in that it was not only a potentially hostile border nation, but also one that had chosen to support Pompey during the Civil War. Caesar could not allow this to go unpunished. This thinking also appears to have been behind the motivation to add Dacia to the campaign targets. Its king, Muribista, was a threat to Roman territory and had also made the mistake of siding with Pompey in the Civil War. With this context in mind, let's now proceed to the invasion plan. The outlines of the invasion plan that survive today are a combination of excerpts from ancient sources. I'll let you pause the video to take a look. Basically, Appian tells us that Caesar planned a campaign against the Getae of Dacia and the Parthians, which would be carried out by 16 legions and 10,000 horse. Suetonius tells us that the Dacians would be dealt with first, and then the Parthians, with an approach being undertaken through Armenia with the intention of a cautious advance. And finally, Plutarch suggests that the campaign would be concluded with an expedition that would see Caesar march around the Black Sea, invading Scythia, then sweeping across to Germania and back through Gaul until finally returning to Italy. Taken at face value, this seems like quite the ambitious campaign. 
The scope and scale of the operation has fueled a lot of speculation in these sorts of what-if discussions, where people like to run around with wild ideas of a Roman Republic of the 1st century BC with borders stretching out across the known world. However, we should be careful to restrain our imaginations. Historians are quick to point out that Plutarch's account of a far-reaching adventure is in keeping with his comparison of the Roman general Julius Caesar to the Hellenic general Alexander the Great and thus is likely to have included quite a bit of literary flourish in his description for the sake of drawing a clearer parallel between the two. After all, Plutarch self-describes his own writings as being more interested in sharing the impressions of his subject's character than the literal accuracy of everything they did. Therefore, in this series, we will largely be limiting the assessment of Caesar's expedition to one that primarily targets just Dacia and Parthia. In 44 BC, Caesar was ready to launch his campaign. However, according to history, he would be assassinated just a few days before leaving Rome. But for our purposes, we will remove this minor inconvenience to our plans. The specific assumption being that the assassination plot never came to fruition while its participants would lay low and undetected, for now. In just a moment, we'll be proceeding onto our alt history timeline. But first, let's just briefly step back to take a look at the wider picture here and see what pieces are on the board worth considering on the Ides of March. Well, first of all, in Rome we have Caesar as dictator in perpetuity. He is accompanied by his right-hand man, Mark Antony. Antony was a military commander who had served with distinction in Gaul and had been left in control of Rome while Caesar was out on his campaigns. Though he had largely mismanaged the role, he would be forgiven by Caesar, who promised to make room for him in his future administration. However, it's likely that Caesar recognized his talents were better served on the battlefield and would plan on bringing him along as a general in the upcoming campaigns. Another key figure in Rome is Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, who currently served as Caesar's master of horse. He was a loyal member of the popularis cause, with talents both in politics and the military. Caesar increasingly trusted him with affairs in Rome, but appears to have planned on bringing him along on the campaigns as well. Other figures of note in Rome included Caesar's would-be murderers. We will assume that most remained in the city, scheming to undermine Caesar. However, I'd like to note that one of them, Marcus Junius Brutus, would turn away from betrayal. Caesar was actually quite fond of the young man, possibly out of love for his mother, and had expressed support for his future career. This included making assurances that Brutus would be made consul one day. In our case, if the assassination attempt does not go through, we will assume that he remains unswayed for now and will remain back in Rome for gradual promotion within Caesar's administration. But perhaps the most interesting figure in Rome at the time was Cleopatra. Not only was she the ruler of Egypt, a friend and ally of Rome, but also the mother of Caesar's three-year-old son, Caesarion. She was in Rome to secure favors for her home country, as well as to promote the legitimacy of her son. Historically though, she would leave for Egypt a few months after Caesar's death, and for our purposes, we will say that this departure occurred shortly after Caesar departs for his own campaigns in late 44 BC. Meanwhile, over in Greece was the 19-year-old Gaius Octavius. He had been sent there by Caesar to continue his education, but also to remain in touch with the army for military training. Some historical records state that Caesar planned to bring Octavius along with him on campaign. However, we will assume that his role on this front will be limited, and instead Octavius will be rotated back to Rome to take on a more prominent role in the government as a part of building up his credentials. After all, he, and not Caesarian, was actually named as Caesar's preferred heir in the dictator's will. There will be more figures to bring up from our real historical timeline, but for now I'll wait to speak more about them until they become relevant. Now with all that pretext out of the way, onto the fun part. In this timeline, Caesar proceeds down the Italian peninsula with Antony and Lepidus to the port of Brundisium. They then ferry over to Greece and meet up with several of the legions already conducting training operations. Given that it's mid-March, there's about a solid 8 months left in the campaigning season to conduct operations for the year's campaign in Dacia. Therefore, a couple of weeks or maybe even a month, will be spared to gather more troops and equipment for the war effort. The full complement of 16 legions mentioned by Appian would probably take longer to get ready, but even having only about half that number would put Caesar on par with his strength during the Gallic Wars. Meanwhile, on the logistical front, 
An operation base will be established in a port city with grain stockpiled and supply lines set up to feed the army. During this lull, perhaps Caesar will meet with Octavius and inform him of his future plans. But this window of calm would not last very long, for Caesar was always one to seize the initiative decisively. After all, fortune favors the bold. But what awaited in Dacia? Well, the region was bounded by the sea and surrounding mountains, with the Carpathians and their highlands forming a naturally defensible core territory. The kingdom of Dacia itself was actually made up of a large number of tribes from across the region that had only recently been united for the first time by King Buribista. They had then used their combined might to conquer the great coastal cities along the Black Sea and raid the surrounding lands of Macedonia. As in Gaul, Dacian warriors were primarily a mix of heavy and light infantrymen who mustered as tribal warbands. Their equipment would have depended on the wealth of each individual and could have featured shields, armor, and helmets. Offensively, they sported spears, swords, axes, and variants of the dreaded falx, whose large, curved blade was capable of cleaving through the sturdiest of armor. Light infantry, skirmishers, and cavalry were also present and had quite the formidable reputation. As an army, the Dacians were versatile. They could fight pitched battles, mount rapid strikes, set ambushes, and make extensive use of defensive fortifications. And if some ancient sources are to be believed, they could field over 100,000 men. So how would Caesar have dealt with this threat? Well, I think it's fairly safe to say that he would have exercised some caution given the terrain and would generally have used a divide and conquer strategy that had proved so successful in Gaul. With this as a template, Caesar in our scenario will make his first moves in April by striking out at the low-hanging fruit that were the Greek cities along the Black Sea coast. Situated in the lowlands, they would have been fairly easy to cut off from the rest of Dacia. In this case, Caesar approaches by both land and sea with a large force, making sure that all are aware of his advance. This serves to overawe the Greek cities into submission with minimal bloodshed. It's likely that the Dacians would not be in a position to block this move at the fringes of their territory, and the Greeks would be fairly free to begin talks with Caesar. The general, in turn, would be sure to act generously to the first who defected, thus precipitating the rapid surrender of the rest. I doubt this would be too hard to achieve given the fact that the inhabitants of these cities were likely eager to be brought back into the fold of their southern brethren. This move would serve as an early win and morale booster for the Romans. Additionally, the coastal cities would be leveraged as a key piece of logistical support for the further campaign. Likely, part of their deals with Caesar involved feeding the army, as had been the case in Gaul. Rome would also have set up garrison forces to protect the cities from enemy counterattacks and to begin establishing new supply depots. Perhaps, the operational base for the campaign would even be moved up to the largest of these Greek cities to be closer to the action. In the following month of May, Caesar will advance from the coast to confront the mighty Danube River. Always one for a show, he will order the construction of some impressive bridge-building projects and parade the troops around as had been done previously across the Rhine in Germania. The objective here would be to win the propaganda fight and overawe the enemy once more. In this very situation, the Germans had simply pulled back into their forests, and thus the Dacians can be expected to have done the same by retreating into their mountains. Should this occur, Caesar will relentlessly pursue his divide and conquer strategy. The clever general will send messages to the various local tribes, playing them off one another in an attempt to drive wedges between them. In my estimation, this would likely have been a very successful strategy to take down the Dacian kingdom, given the fact that real history saw King Buribista assassinated by his own nobles in 44 BC and his realm splinter into pieces that would not be reunited for another century. However, Caesar's presence may have actually had the opposite effect and served to unify the Dacians around their king against a common enemy. The periphery of the kingdom may be easy to take, but conquest of the interior would require quite the arduous campaign. This is best evidenced by the Dacian Wars of the 1st and 2nd century AD, which featured heavy fighting against fortified positions and numerous setbacks. It could be argued that Caesar would be more than up for the task given his experience with siege warfare and the amount of resources he could bring to bear. However, given the fact that the riches of the East were also on the agenda, I don't think that Caesar would have allowed himself to be distracted here for too long. Therefore, I believe that Caesar would have spent the month of June seeking a decisive battle with the Dacian army. 
Burabista may have met him in the field, but as we saw in Gaul, these sorts of symmetrical engagements almost always saw the Romans victorious. Therefore, if Burabista was clever, he would immediately undertake the type of asymmetrical warfare that proved so successful for future kings of the region. This will inevitably cause some attrition on the Roman side. However, Caesar will find ways to force the enemy to come to him. He will seek local towns and start seizing them one by one to put pressure on Burabista to react. This will at first begin with some leniency to incentivize Dacians to surrender before the ram hits the wall. But if they prove obstinate, Caesar will not be afraid to brutalize the population. If resistance continues and the enemy refuses to fight an open battle, Caesar will up the ante by immediately marching on the capital of Sarmiz Gatusa, laying siege to it by the beginning of August. This will be the makings of an incredible showdown as the city was located atop a 1200 meter hill and defended by a network of six fortresses. Trajan would actually find himself in this very position over a century later. In both sieges, fortifications will strangle the city, artillery will batter the defenses, and legions will storm the breaches. The fight will be hard, but as seen with the sieges of the Gallic oppidums of Avaricum and Alesia, little could stand in the way of Caesar in these affairs. By the end of August, the city will be in ruins. While the loss of Sarmiz Gattuso by no means meant the total defeat of the Dacians, I think it would serve as a turning point for the war. Caesar only has about two months left in the campaigning season and will be looking to settle a peace. The Dacians might still resist, but given their internal divisions, would likely be willing to give up their unified kingdom in return for allowing the tribes to maintain local control over smaller states. Caesar will probably offer them something to this effect, but make arrangements such that peace will be secured at least in the short term. This probably means the annexation of southern Dacia through the formation of the province of Moesia, something that would occur historically at the beginning of the first century AD. Caesar's actions will therefore simply be advancing the given historical timeline. Thus, the Dacian campaign would come to a conclusion by the end of September, in late 44 BC. Join us next time as we explore the interwar period where Caesar returns to Rome to celebrate a triumph and settle affairs before setting off once more for his expedition against the Parthians. I hope you've enjoyed the exploration of this fascinating what-if scenario. If you'd like to learn more about similar aspects of Roman history, you can do so through our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. They offer subscription-based, on-demand lecture videos put together by top professors from renowned universities and specialists from places like the National Geographic and the Smithsonian. You get unlimited access to a huge library of over 11,000 videos which cover topics from history to science, math, and literature, with new content being added every month. Their history playlist is honestly amazing, and I've been binging on lectures for over a year now. In preparation for creating my own documentaries, I've been working my way through their 24 part long series on the rise of Rome. The lecture does a great job presenting the material in an accessible way and weaves in important factors like geography and culture into the discussion. If you enjoyed this particular episode, I highly recommend lectures 20 through 24, which explore the events of the Civil War and discuss the fallout which led to the collapse of the Republic. For me, I found it best to download the app on my phone. This allows me to swap from video to audio mode so I can listen to the series as a podcast on my commute. Right now, The Great Courses Plus is offering a free trial, which you can start by clicking the link in the description below or visiting thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Invicta. I highly recommend that you take a look at what they have to offer and dive into the material you are most interested in. A huge thanks is owed to our supporters on Patreon and to many talented researchers, writers, and artists who made this video possible. Please consider contributing to fund future content. If you found this topic interesting, check out these related videos about our fascinating past. Be sure to like and subscribe for more history, and check out our description for ways to support the channel. Thanks for watching.